The spiritual meaning is captured alongside the physical meaning. This is the world where the spiritual and the physical meet together. So the wording used combines the spiritual and the physical. It's incredible. When Najmi idha hawa ma dhanna sahibukum wa ma rawa A'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-wajim Wa laqad ra'ahu naslatan ukhra Inda sidrati al-muntaha Inda ha jannatu al-ma'wa إذ يغشى السدرة ما يغشى ما زاغ البصر وما طغى لقد رأى من آيات ربه القبرى رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يبقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد once again everyone السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, I'm going to go back to Indaha Jannatul Ma'wa and share some more things with you. Jannah could be described as Jannatul Khud, the gardens of eternity. It could just be described as Al Jannah, the garden. We know what it is. But the attribution made to Jannah here was Jannatul Ma'wa, the Jannah of ultimate refuge. And we didn't really spend time thinking about what that could mean. There's a contrast being made here. This life that you and I live right now can have lots of jannas. Allah describes in Surah Al-Kahf people that, a a guy that owned two jannas, jannatain. Kilta jannataini ata tukulaha, right? So, ayuhibbu ahaduhum, ahadukum antakuna lahu jannatun min nakheel wa inab, tajri min tahtiha al-anhar, lahu fiha min kulli al-thamarat in Surah Al-Baqarah. Wouldn't any of you like to have a garden that has these, these, these qualities? Those of you that have extra money in, in COVID times, there was a rise in construction prices in Texas, especially in backyard reconstruction, because people were upgrading their jannas in the backyard, right? They're, they're, just, they're, they're spending time building their garden. Some of the, you know, when I, when I travel, sometimes there are people that are like high rollers. They want to meet with me and stuff. Okay, I'll have lunch in your fancy place. And you'll go to their house and it's like gated and security guards and all that. And you drive through and they have this house. But it's not the house that is the amazing feature. You're going to have a nice house anywhere. It's this huge garden and walls and the privacy and, you know, their grandkids running around and the water fountain, you know, the the Jannah. It's, It's the Jannah. And this is something that human beings deeply desire. Uh, we go we go to vacation in places that look like a Jannah. We try to create a Jannah kind of atmosphere in our backyards. We, If we can't have a whole Jannah in our office cubicle, which is depressing, you'll put a little Jannah plant there. You know, your, your, your mother, if she's from where I'm from, uh, if they can't have too many bugs in the house because of the plants, they'll put plastic Jannah in the house, plastic flowers, plastic leaves, you know, just at least make it look like there's greenery. Human beings have an... And by the way, Jannah means to cover greenery, lush greenery that covers. The, the jinn are called the jinn because they're covered from our eyes. The, the baby is in the belly of a mother is called janin because it's hidden, it's covered. So the land where the dirt is covered with greenery and flowers and beauty, that's why it's called Jannah. Anyway, the point I was making... Was this life, you can have Jannah, but it's never going to be a refuge. You can have beautiful things in this world. You can have money, you can have a nice house, you can have beautiful family, you can have all of those things. It's never secure. It's never permanently safe. And the more you find security in anything in this world, the more you are set up for misery. You're just you're set up for misery. People say things like, ah, oh, I don't know what I would do if you weren't there. Without you, I don't know if I can live. Yeah, you live. You live. The, the Sahaba lived after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. You're going to be fine. You're not, your love is not that dramatic. <gasps> I can't breathe. Yes, you can. There's still oxygen. Your nose still inhales. Your lungs still expand. These are just dramatic things to say 
But the point is, there are people who create a dependency, dependency on money, dependency on beauty. You know, there are people that used to look beautiful and they were famous because of their beauty. And then they got older and, you know, their beauty went away and now they're depressed or even suicidal and all of it because their refuge was their beauty. Somebody's refuge was their garden. Somebody's refuge was their money. Somebody's refuge was their fame. We have all these different refuges that make us feel safe. One of the most uh, interesting things that I've studied in psychology is the human need for safety. The human need for safety. And this is a need that people in war zones have and people that are billionaires have too. You know, famous people are some of the loneliest people in the world. You'll, you'll think people are always around them, but they can't trust anybody. Are these people close to me because I'm famous? Are they, do they see me as someone that they know only by my fame? But if they knew the real me, would I still be safe with them? Or are they going to share with the world? Here's what I know about this famous person, right? They're, they're unsafe. And one of the, mo the most difficult thing for them is to find someone they can be what with? They can be safe with. They have no matwa. They can have the most beautiful house and security guards and all of it, but they have no one that can have an honest conversation with them. They don't have a matwa. A president of a country trusts his best friend. Next thing you know, his best friend released a press release or leaked some information in the media and destroyed the president's campaign or whatever. Does that happen? Yeah. Because even the most, the guy that looks like he has all this security actually doesn't have security at all. He's living in insecurity. That's what he's living with. One of the most powerful human beings described in the Quran is Fir'aun. You guys know that, right? Extremely powerful. And you know what Allah says? وَنُرِيَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَمَادَ وَجُنُودَهُمَ مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَحْذَرُونَ حَذِرْ فِرْعَوْن فِرْعَوْن Allah says we, we, we were going to show the Pharaoh and his military what they were afraid of. Wait, you live in the biggest castle on earth your monuments are still around on the planet today and you're, not, you're afraid? Human beings don't have ultimate safety in this world other than Allah. And Allah says that there's, we, human beings are looking for safety and security. People are working hard, working hard. I know people that like, they, they live in really small apartments, live very uncomfortable lives because they're saving, 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 saving because they have this ultimate goal for financial security 10 years down the line. And they're working on it even from now, right? Long-term thinking. All of that is what? The pursuit of ma'wa, the pursuit of a refuge. That's what you want. They call it a safety net, the golden parachute. Isn't that what they call it? That's all terminology in this modern world te terminology for al ma'wa. The people go to a therapist. I feel anxiety. I feel insecure. I feel nervous. I feel I can't trust anyone. I have ma'wa issues. Is what that is. And Allah says, "Indaha jannatul ma'wa." I didn't mention from a nahu point of view, jannatul ma'wa is mu'arraf because it's a idafa. I know I'm getting technical. What that means in basic English is there's an ikhtisas here. What what that would mean is only there is the garden of refuge. In other words, ultimate refuge it cannot be found in any other garden. In any other thing that's beautiful, it can be beautiful, but it can't be safe. You know, one of the most shocking things that happened in one of my trips recently, I met this young lady. I was talking to some TV producer about something. We were old friends uh, in a country that shall not be named and people shall not be named, right? So, and she was um, an actress or something very famous in her country. And she's like, oh, I, I see so many of your videos. I was like, cool. Because she, she walked into the studio. We started talking. And when a little bit after the conversation, she, she told me her, her show took off. Uh, you know, her, she got new contracts. She's more famous than she's ever been. This, the career is like going like this. And her, her movie got so many awards and blah, 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 blah. And then she started saying, can I ask you something? I was like, what? What if you feel like you don't belong anywhere and you're not safe anywhere and you just want to end your life? What do you do? I was like, there are millions and millions of young women that look at you and say, I wish I was you. And here you are, you poor creature. I wish I was dead. She's not safe. She's not safe. 
from, from millions of fans, they wish they could be that. She doesn't have ma'wa. When Allah says, عِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى He's given us a profound truth. We can't look for safety anywhere else. It's only with Allah. And the other thing about ma'wa, refuge, you know, like fa'wu ila al-kahfi, take refuge in the cave in Surah Al-Kahf, right? Awi ila al-jabali ya'asimuni min al-ma. The son of Nuh alayhi salam said, I'm going to take refuge in the mountain. It will protect me from the water. This is about refuge. Refuge is when you're getting away from something negative, isn't it? You're getting away from something negative. Jannah is the first time we're truly going to be away from all negative things. Ultimate refuge. But just because you mentioned getting away from the negative, that still doesn't mean you've mentioned anything positive. Okay, the problems are gone. We're safe. Jannatul Ma'wa. But is there something greater? Okay, well in Jannah, by the word Jannah, it means trees, shade, fruits, beauty. All of that is captured inside the word Jannah. But then Allah says, إِذْ يَغْشَ السِّدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَ That tree and all of it gets covered by something more. And that more is going to be the riba of Allah for us, the pleasure of Allah. Even in Jannah, in the beginning, we're going to have food and drinks and company and all of that. But that's not the ultimate prize of Jannah. It's salamun qawlam min rabbir rahim, The meeting with God. Allah Himself saying salam to you. That's the ultimate. وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ Faces that are lit, staring at their Rabb. That's the ultimate prize. You know, now think about that, not in the Jannah sense. Let's think about this in the dunya sense, in this world. When we commit sin, and we all commit sin, when we commit sin, we're, in the beginning we're afraid of punishment. Right? Because the sin is punishable. We don't want to be questioned on judgment day, it's written against us and the punishment of the hellfire. But you know what? Something else that the sin does that is much more expensive, much more damaging than even the punishment? The sin makes my heart hard and I cannot feel the presence of Allah as strongly as I used to feel it in my heart. The sin is making me like uh, insensitive. It's like, you know, when you take the anesthesia and you can't feel anything, now I'm sinning and I can't feel anything when I pray. Now I'm sinning, I'm saying the dua, but I don't feel anything. Now I'm sinning and I'm reciting Quran and I can't feel anything. And that is distance from Allah Himself. Distance from Allah Himself. And that's actually, if you, if you internalize that, then your relationship with sin will change. Like, I can't lose that. If you felt it, if you feel it one time, there are moments in your life where you felt a closeness to Allah like you never felt it before. You can probably even remember that moment right now. Where you were, where your eyes were, what tears you felt, that moment is ingrained in your heart. In fact, the moment where you fell in love with someone or you saw your baby for the first time or your wedding day, those memories are fuzzy. You're like, remember how we felt? Not really. Remember when I was born? Okay, yeah, I, I remember the hospital. You can't remember the feel, but the, the feeling of being close to Allah, oh, maybe you felt it last Ramadan, maybe you felt it when you did a Umrah, maybe you felt it during a khutbah somewhere. You know when it was. That feeling, that's the ultimate closeness to Allah. It even overshadows the desire for Jannah. Because there's, there's a reward, there's a tama'nina in it, there's a calmness in it that cannot be compared to anything. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is now, you know, actually I'll, I'll read uh, uh, Fa'alabi's uh, commentary before I go on, on this ayah. When the, the thing that covers covered, we're talking about that ayah, yeah? He says, ذَكَرَ الْمُفَسِّرُونَ فِي وَصْفِهَا أَخْوَانًا to describe this thing that covered, Mufassirun said lots of things. They tried to come up with, what could it be that covered? fil aya, And all of that is just overkill. They're trying too hard. Takalluf means they're trying too hard. It's not authentic. Because Allah Himself made it a mystery. 
Allah, if he wanted to tell us what covered, he would have told us himself. But they want an explanation. He says, But the Prophet already said, The Prophet one description, we don't know the authenticity of this report entirely, but if we take this report, he says, it was covered by colors. I don't know what they are. <laughs> it was covered by colors. I don't know what they are. Now, it's interesting that the word colors was used because colors are a refraction of light, right? So the spectrum of color we have is refracted from light. But nur in the unseen world is much more advanced than the nur of this world. So when that refracts, the colors that it produces we don't even know what they are. It's beyond our description. And that's the closest we get to a description of what was covering the low tree when it covered. But one thing is for sure. If he's mentioning colors, then it has to do with light. That's for sure. So whatever took over was some kind of brilliant light. Right? Because otherwise you wouldn't have colors. Okay. Now we get to the incredible statement from Allah about the Prophet Sallallahu experience. He's looking at this takeover of this new kind of light. And he says, Ma al basar. The eye did not turn away or deviate. Let me tell you a little bit about deviate. When teeth are crooked, like British people, or spears are bent, uh, that's called tazayug. When something is bent and it doesn't want to come back, like the teeth being crooked, you need kind of braces or something to set them straight. They don't want to come back on their own. From this, or um, these expressions in the Quran mean when someone deviated from the right path, when they deviated from the right path. So, what does it mean? Another expression in Surah Al-Ahzab is إِذْزَاغَتِ absar When the eyes deviated. Meaning, the enemy was coming. In Surah Al-Ahzab, the enemy was coming and the Muslims were terrified because there were civilians inside a city and there was an overwhelming force coming to, to invade the city. So we were even, the, some people were even having a hard time making eye contact with the enemy. They would look away, not look directly at the enemy because it was too terrifying. Some of you have زَيْغُ basar when you're watching a horror movie, astaghfirullah. I can't watch. That's zaghat al absar. Now, if you try to stare at the sun, your eyes are going to squint and you're going to want to what? Look away. The light of this tree is much more intense than the light of the sun, isn't it? So the Prophet, وسلم, when he's about to look, what should naturally happen to his sight? He should want to turn away. But he says his eye didn't deviate. His eye didn't turn away. Now, you maybe have done this as a kid because you're stupid and I was stupid. We don't do this as adults. Sometimes your friend says, let's stare at the sun for 10 seconds. They're like, okay, let's do it. And you do it for 10 seconds and what happens after 10 seconds? Now you see these yellow, purple flashes everywhere. Like, what's on your face? That's nur, bro. That's nur. <laughs> your, uh, your vision becomes corrupted because you stared at the sun too long. One of the meanings of wama taha is he stared at what he stared at, the light, the, the new overarching you know, phenomenon. He stared at it and his eye didn't turn away. And by turning away, his eyesight didn't go bad. He didn't start seeing things that aren't there. That's one of its meanings. So he was able to withstand seeing this, this vision. Um, this is actually the meaning of taha, lots and lots and lots of meanings, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to go into that uh, today. But I will tell you that it means exceeding the limit, going too far. You know what that means? You look at something, but if you look for too long, it'll do damage to you, right? So. He says he saw it and it still didn't do damage to him. It still didn't damage him. 
But then there are scholars who had reflections on this experience of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ma ataja was al had ila malam yudan lahu. Ma taghir means he looked at what he was supposed to look at, but he was, you know, ma anna dalik al alam gharibun an bani adam. It's amazing commentary by al Biqai rahimahullah. He says the Prophet is in a new universe. No human being has ever seen this place. When you're in a new place, you've never seen. Where does your eye go? Everywhere. Everywhere. But when the thing covered the tree, the Prophet looked at it and didn't look anywhere else and didn't like, okay, I've seen enough of that. I'm going to look here, here. But what else is here? What else is here? No, the eye didn't violate. The, the eye didn't exceed this view. It's as if this was so captivating that it didn't allow for him to look even anywhere else. Something took over the tree that was so empowering that even though he's in this incredibly new, shocking world, he doesn't want to look at anything else. He, he, doesn't, he, he can't. Not only is his eye able to tolerate it, withstand it, that's ma'zaq al-basar, his eye doesn't want to go anywhere else. He's just like you, you, he's just staring and staring and staring. Another meaning that's been taken from this. Actually, I'll, I'll tell you tell you that Razi thing a little later. It's really beautiful too. You know, when you're staring at something, it could look respectful or disrespectful. You know that, right? Sometimes when I'm at an airport, I'm dressed in civilian clothing, and uh, people think they know me, but they're not sure yet. So you know what they do? They look at me like this. And I honestly think they're mad because I exist. I've offended this person somehow, or he thinks that I'm somehow like the, the, the spawn of the devil. I don't know what. But he's staring at me like, you know the bad guy stares at you in a movie, astaghfirullah. And then they keep getting closer and I keep getting more nervous because the look is still... And then they get closer and they say, are you Nawali Khan? <laughs> Their face changes after that. And then I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah. Half of me wants to say, no, that's my cousin. No, it's, it's not me. You got the wrong guy. <laughs> but you know, the look can actually be kind of disrespectful too. Kind of offensive too. Sometimes you're staring at your mom. Some kids have this weird staring problem. And they, when kids that are weird, they stare and they have their mouth open. And you're, you're staring and your mom says, God, what are you looking at? Because you, you're staring in a way that is, that is not respectful. Then you're staring at something with awe. The way we stare at the Kaaba is not like this. We don't do that. We don't do this. There's a love in our eyes. There's a humility in our eyes. The eyes affect the entire face. You know that, right? The eyes affect the entire face. He says, the eye didn't turn away, but he looked in a way that isn't rebellious. He looked with humility and love and awe. So the wama taqa adds yet another dimension. Because just because you're constantly staring at something, it can actually be Offensive too. But he took, he took that meaning off the table when he said, وَمَا تَغَى You see that? It, similarly, another place in the Qur'an, the Quraysh, the Kuffar, stare at the Prophet But the way they stare at him, لَيُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ لَمَّا سَمِعُوا الذِّكْرِ وَإِنْ كَادَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَيُزْلِقُونَكَ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ They stare at you like they want you to fall off, like they're shooting laser beams at you. Like that. You know? Like some of you, we, we don't have really much public transportation in, uh, in Dallas, but I'll give you a New York reference. When you're on a subway in New York or on a bus in New York, some people just like, awkward. You just got to change trains, go the other way, get off the next stop, even if it's not your home. Because this guy's like, you know, you know this is now let's get to Imam Razi's beautiful uh, insight. The eye didn't deviate. And it didn't cross limits. That's the basic meaning. Deviate and cross limits. Zaga is deviate. Taha is cross limits. But in Arabic, 
For deviate, you can say mala. Ma mana al basar. The eye didn't deviate. And crossing limits could be tajawaza. So the word it could have been ma mala al basaru wa ma tajawaza. What's the point of saying zaha as opposed to mala and saying tagha as opposed to tajawaza? Because both zaha and tagha have spiritual meanings too. Mala and tajawaza don't. Zaha, like Azaha Allahu Kulubahum. Rabbana la tuzir kulubana ba'da id hadaytana. His eye didn't deviate, but the spiritual meaning is his heart never deviated. Wa ma tagha, his eye didn't go anywhere else. His eye remained humble, but his heart never re would never rebel either. The spiritual meaning is captured alongside the physical meaning. This is the world where the spiritual and the physical meet together. So the wording used combines the spiritual and the physical. It's incredible. Perfection of words. Ma zagh al basaru wa ma taha. Now, final ayah of this passage. Now I get to the. Uh, oh, by the way, one one other meaning of sidra, Imam Razi. Before I get to the last part. Sidra actually also means the climax of something. And then by adding al-muntaha to it, it's the ultimate climax of climaxes. Sidra al-muntaha. He says, أَنْ يَكُونَ ذَلِكَ بَيَانًا لِمُصُولِ مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى سدرة اليقين يعني إلى منتهى اليقين إلى سدرة اليقين الذي لا يقين فوقه It's as if Allah is describing when his eyes didn't deviate and his, he didn't rebel that he reached a level of conviction there is no conviction above that. Physically, the Prophet was higher than any other creation. And spiritually, the Prophet has an iman more than no other, more than any other creation. SubhanAllah. And this is inside Ma Zagh al Basar wa Ma Taha. Hey guys, you just watched a small clip of me explaining the Quran in depth as part of the Deeper Look series. Studying the Quran in depth can seem like a really intimidating thing that's only meant for scholars. Our job at Bayan is to make deeper study of the Qur'an, accessible and easy for all of you. So take us up on that challenge. Join us for this study, the deeper look of the Qur'an, for this surah and many other surahs on BayinaTV.com under the Deeper Look section.